Why? Schaefer is the... Get ready to raise a glass to the past. We're taking a nostalgic dive into the brews that once quenched our thirst, but have since disappeared. From classic Schlitz to iconic hams, these beers will transport you back to the days when they were a staple in bars and backyards alike. So sit back, crack open a cold one, and join us as we toast to the beloved brews of yesteryears in one hour of forgotten beers that have faded into history. They brew it into Valentine for flavor genuine. It's got that golden flavor, true ale flavor. Oh, that Number one, Valentine Triple X Ale. Valentine Triple X Ale was a brew by the P. Valentine and Sons Brewing Company, founded in 1820 in Newark, New Jersey. The Triple X wasn't a reference to anything spicy but rather a nickname that stuck after it won three gold medals at international exhibitions in the early 1900s. In the 1970s, Ballantine Triple X Ale was a major player, riding high alongside other popular American beers of the time. Industry sources estimate Ballantine Triple X Ale sales were down to around 500,000 barrels in 1970. However, by the late 1990s, the Ballantine Brewery was acquired by InBev, a large brewing conglomerate. Golden Mellow, Valentine, Valentine Beer. InBev's focus shifted away from Valentine Triple X Ale and it was eventually discontinued in the early 2000s. Despite its appearance, Valentine Triple X Ale is still fondly remembered by some beer drinkers, and there have even been rumors of a possible comeback. As the last sips of Valentine Triple X Ale fade into memory, what fate awaits another iconic brew like Rheingold beer? Will its legacy endure like Valentine's, or will it vanish into the annals of brewing history like so many others? On the road to Mandalay, the bay is doing, so do it, enjoy Rheingold beer. Number two, Rheingold beer. Rheingold beer was brewed by the Rheingold Brewery, founded in Brooklyn in 1883. It was a popular choice for decades, known for its crisp, dry taste and clever marketing. Rheingold wasn't shy about its German heritage, with a name referencing the Rhine River and a logo featuring a mythic maiden. In the 1950s and 60s, Rheingold reigned supreme on the East Coast, especially in its New York hometown. They all enjoy Rheingold beer, friendly, freshening, happily dry. No other beer is like Rheingold. Their advertising was legendary, featuring catchy jingles, the popular Miss Rheingold beauty pageant, and even appearances by celebrities like Jackie Robinson and John Wayne. However, by the 1970s, Rheingold's grip started to loosen, national competition intensified, and consumer taste shifted towards lighter beers. The Rheingold Brewery closed in 1976, and the brand sputtered under different owners before disappearing in the 1980s. Schaefer is the one beer to have when you're having more than one. Number three, Schaefer beer. Schaefer beer, a New York favorite with a long history, was brewed by the F and M Schaefer Brewing Company. Founded in 1842 by German immigrant brothers, Schaefer brought the lager style, then unheard of in the U.S., to thirsty New Yorkers. The beer was known for being easy drinking and affordable brewed with a classic blend of malts and hops. Schaefer's popularity soared throughout the 20th century. By the 1970s, it was a national brand, boasting sales in the millions of barrels. Interestingly, Schaefer held the record for the most beer sold in Puerto Rico during the 1970s, a whopping 13 million cases in a year. Their success was fueled by clever marketing and a strong connection to blue-collar workers. A Schaefer thirst. Schaefer always gives me what I want from a beer, a crisp, smooth taste that's always satisfying. However, Schaefer's fortunes changed hands in the 1980s with a series of acquisitions. The brand eventually landed with the Pabst Brewing Company, which continues to produce Schaefer today. While still available in some areas, it's no longer the national powerhouse it once was. Schaefer Beer. Schaefer beer was a classic American beer that gained popularity in the mid-20th century. It was known for its catchy slogan, 
the one beer to have when you're having more than one. Suggesting a light drinkable beer suitable for social gatherings. Schaefer was a staple in the 1960s and 70s, enjoyed at backyard barbecues, sports events, and neighborhood bars. It was widely sold across the United States in grocery stores, liquor stores, and gas stations, typically priced at around a dollar to two dollars per bottle or can. A beer that good? So come, come into the Schaefer Circle. Despite its popularity, Schaefer beer lost its market share in the late 1970s. The beer industry experienced significant changes, with larger breweries and new brands becoming more prominent. Schaefer needed help to keep up with shifting trends in consumer. Pabst Blue Ribbon from the very first round. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. Number four, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Pabst Blue Ribbon had a different story before its cool factor comeback. Originally brewed by the Pabst Brewing Company, founded in 1844 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Pabst Blue Ribbon was a staple for budget-minded beer drinkers. The Blue Ribbon wasn't a fancy award, but a marketing tactic referencing early 20th century Blue Ribbons awarded at county fairs. While not a high-end brew, Pabst Blue Ribbon was known for its consistent quality and affordability. Taste that smoother, smoother flavor, Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Finest beer, sir, anywhere, Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. In the 1970s, it was a major player, selling millions of barrels annually. However, by the 1980s and 90s, consumer taste shifted towards lighter beers and flashier brands. Pabst Blue Ribbon's image became associated with being a cheap option, and sales slumped. The brand nearly faded into obscurity. Ironically, this decline paved the way for its unexpected return. Pabst's low price point attracted a new generation of budget-conscious drinkers seeking a no-frills beer in the early 2000s. This, combined with a clever marketing campaign that embraced Pabst Blue Ribbon's blue-collar roots, led to its surprising resurgence in popularity. The tale of Pabst Blue Ribbon's rise and fall echoes through the halls of brewing history. Then marketing didn't resonate with the beer-drinking audience of the late 1960s. By the early 1970s, Gablingers had faded from the market, unable to establish a strong following. However, its concept laid the groundwork for the light beer category, later gaining popularity with brands like Miller Lite and Bud Light. Apple Beer Apple Beer was a non-alcoholic, apple-flavored beverage that became popular in the 1960s. Despite its name, it wasn't beer in the traditional sense, but a carbonated apple drink with a similar bubbly texture and a sweet apple flavor. It was designed to appeal to those who enjoyed the refreshing soda fizz, but wanted an alternative to colas and citrus drinks. Apple beer was sold in grocery stores and convenience stores across the United States, typically costing around a dollar per bottle or can. The drink gained a following among those who appreciated its crisp apple taste, somewhat different from the usual soda offerings at the time. It was trendy at parties and family gatherings, serving as a non-alcoholic option that still felt festive. However, as the 1970s approached, apple beer began to lose popularity, facing competition from other fruit-flavored sodas and changing consumer tastes. By the mid-1970s, apple beer had largely disappeared from the market, becoming a nostalgic memory for those who enjoyed its unique apple flavor. But did Falstaff beer face a similar twist of fate? Will its once mighty legacy be resurrected, or will it remain lost in the annals of forgotten brews like so many others? There's light-hearted living in light-hearted Falstaff beer. Number five, Falstaff beer. Falstaff beer, once a major contender in the American brewing scene, was brewed by the Falstaff Brewing Corporation, founded in 1903 in St. Louis, Missouri. Named after a character from Shakespeare, Falstaff was an American lager known for being smooth and inoffensive. While exact sales figures are fuzzy, by the 1960s, Falstaff was a powerhouse, reaching its peak in 1965 with a staggering 7 million barrels brewed in a single year. Charlie, another Falstaff, please. <laughs> Back then, Falstaff was considered a premium beer, sponsoring sporting events and boasting a classier image than some competitors. 
America's premium quality beer. Sing out now, the time is here for cool, refreshing ball tap. However, the 1970s brought a shift in the industry. Consolidation among breweries intensified, and lighter lagers started dominating the market. Falstaff was slow to adapt and struggled to keep pace. Ownership changes and production shutdowns followed throughout the 1970s and 80s. Although Pabst Brewing Company now owns the rights, Falstaff went out of production in 2005. They are switching to burger. It's brewed for a man's taste, brewed to be the finest beer in the world today. Number six, burger beer. Burger beer was a popular brew in the Midwest during the 1970s, courtesy of the Burger Brewing Company. Founded in 1852 in St. Louis, Missouri, Burger Brewing was known for its lagers and malt liquors. It was a regional favorite, particularly in the Midwest, and its catchy advertising slogan, Burger Beer, it's the Burgermeister, helped solidify brand recognition. So pour him the smooth beer, one of a kind. Burger, the best tasting beer you can find. You never had it so smooth. Despite its regional success, Burger Brewing Company faced financial difficulties throughout the 70s and 80s. The company eventually ceased production in the early 1990s, and the Burger Beer brand faded into obscurity. Despite this, some beer enthusiasts still remember Burger Beer fondly, and there's a certain allure to its classic American brewing heritage. Number one, Tahitian Treat Fruit Punch. This brightly colored, caffeine-free soda hit the shelves in 1966, courtesy of the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. Back then, it was a real head-turner. Unlike the colas and root beers dominating the market, Tahitian Treat offered a burst of tropical fruit flavors, perfectly capturing the sunshine and beach vibes of the decade. At a price of just around a nickel a bottle, it was an affordable treat for kids and adults alike. The public went wild for a Tahitian Treat. Its success was undeniable, becoming a staple at picnics, barbecues, and pool parties. But like many fans of the 60s, the original Tahitian treat ended. The exact reason remains a mystery, but some speculate it might have been a reformulation that strayed too far from the beloved original flavor. Today, what you find on store shelves under the Tahitian treat name is a shadow of its former self. The vibrant branding and unique taste we remember from the 60s are replaced by a more generic fruit punch flavor. The vibrant nostalgia of Tahitian Treat Fruit Punch fades into a mere shadow of its former self, preferences, leading to a decline in sales. By the 1980s, Schaefer had largely faded from the beer scene, disappearing from store shelves and bar taps. The golden era of Schaefer beer dimmed, but could Gamblinger's Beer, with its innovative approach to light beer, have offered a refreshing alternative to Schaefer's decline? Gamblinger's Beer Gamblinger's Beer was an early attempt at creating a light beer introduced in 1967 by Rheingold Brewery. It was designed to appeal to health-conscious consumers who wanted a lower-calorie beer and less alcohol. Gamblinger's used a unique brewing process to reduce the calorie content while maintaining a traditional beer flavor. It was a novel concept then, as most beers were full-bodied and high in calories. Gamblinger's Beer was sold in select markets across the U.S., typically grocery and liquor stores. It was priced similarly to other beers, usually around a dollar to a dollar and fifty cents per bottle or can. Despite this innovative approach, Gamblinger's failed to gain traction, partly because the market was still being prepared for light beer. The taste Hey man, we'll trade you two cases of our beer for one of those. Hey, you gotta be kidding. Number seven, Stroh's Bohemian Style Beer. Stroh's Bohemian Style Beer, a taste of Detroit history, was brewed by the Stroh Brewery Company. Founded in 1850 by Bernhard Stroh, a German immigrant, Stroh's quickly became a Detroit staple. Their Bohemian Style Beer was an homage to Stroh's family brewing heritage, boasting a crisp, clean taste and a unique amber color. Stroh's marketing campaigns often capitalized on the beer's Bohemian roots, emphasizing its European connection. However, the company struggled to adapt to changing consumer preferences in the 1980s and 90s, as lighter lagers and flashier brands took center stage. Stroh's Bohemian Style Beer was eventually discontinued in the late 20th century, and the Stroh Brewery Company itself was acquired by Pabst Brewing in 1985. After the amber hues of Stroh's Bohemian Style Beer fade into memory, 
But what led to Rondo's appeal among adults seeking a tart punch? And how did it carve out its niche in the competitive beverage market? Rondo has a clean, citrus taste that's never sticky. Rondo, the thirst crusher. Number two, Rondo Citrus Soda. Launched in 1978 by Cadbury Schweppes, Rondo wasn't your average orange soda. It packed a tart punch, a citrus flavor that went beyond the sweetness typical of the time. This appealed to adults who craved a less sugary and more sophisticated soda experience. Rondo boasted a distinct identity, which was showcased in commercials where people crush cans to emphasize its thirst-crushing prowess. Its competitive price point attracted fans seeking a tangy citrus flavor. Despite not reaching the heights of significant colas, Rondo fostered a devoted fan base in the early 1980s. Its decline in the mid-1980s remains a mystery. Theories range from heightened competition in the citrus soda sector to changing consumer taste favoring sweeter beverages. Whatever the cause, Rondo's legacy lives on in the memories of those who loved its bold citrus flavor. Did Olympia beer face a similar struggle against the tide of changing taste? Like Stroh's, will its legacy become a relic of regional brewing history, or will it endure as a timeless symbol of the Pacific Northwest brewing heritage? But Olympia wouldn't change a word, and that's why I changed to Oli. A great beer doesn't change, and Oli never wins. Number 8. Olympia Beer Olympia Beer, a West Coast icon, was brewed by the Olympia Brewing Company, Founded in 1896 in Turnwater, Washington, this crisp pale lager was known for its refreshing taste and connection to the Pacific Northwest. The company famously touted the pure water from the Turnwater Falls as a key ingredient with the slogan, It's the Water. Olympia, it's the water, and a lot more. Olympia Beer was a major player in American brewing history, especially throughout the West and Pacific Northwest. Their marketing capitalized on the region's national beauty, often featuring imagery of mountains and evergreens. At its peak, Olympia beer was a beloved choice for many on the West Coast. However, increased competition from national brands in the 70s and 80s took its toll. Miller Brewing Company acquired the Olympia Brewing Company in 1983, and Olympia beer production eventually ceased in the early 2000s. The water beer makes pearl beer. Number 9, Pearl Beer. Pearl Beer, a Texas treasure from San Antonio, was brewed by the Pearl Brewing Company. Founded in the 1880s by various owners, Pearl's story is intertwined with the city's growth. Their signature brew was a German-style lager known for being smooth and easy drinking. By the 1970s, Pearl was a Texas powerhouse, selling millions of barrels a year and becoming the state's biggest brewery. Brews a Texas tradition. Pearl. Pearl's success stemmed in part from its down-to-earth Texan identity. Their commercials often featured real people enjoying a pearl after a hard day's work, solidifying their connection to the local community. However, by the late 1990s, the Pearl Brewing Company was acquired by a large conglomerate, InBev. InBev's focus shifted away from Pearl, and production eventually ceased in 2001. Interestingly, the Pearl brand has been revived under new ownership in recent years, offering a fresh take on some classic Pearl brews and a chance to recapture its former glory. The echoes of Pearl Beer's Texan charm linger. However, did Billy Beer's fleeting fame face a fate akin to Pearl's rise and fall? <gasps> Billy Beer! <laughs> Number 10, Billy Beer. Billy Beer was a novelty brew of the 1970s, more famous for its namesake than its taste. Brewed by the Fall City Brewing Company of Louisville, Kentucky, Billy Beer was the brainchild of Billy Carter, the younger brother of then-president Jimmy Carter. Billy Beer gained national attention due to its connection to the White House. Billy, known for his flamboyant personality, enthusiastically promoted the beer, with each can boasting his signature and claiming, I had this beer brewed just for me. It's the best beer I've ever tasted, and I've tasted a lot. Despite the hype, Billy Beer wasn't exactly a hit with critics. This ordinary American lager struggled to compete with established brands. Moreover, some found the association with the presidency tacky. 
by 1978, Falls City Brewing Company closed down and Billy Beer disappeared along with it. Although a short-lived fad, Billy Beer remains a reminder of a peculiar moment in American pop culture and political history. Number 19, White Rock Beverages, Specific Flavors. White Rock Beverages, a brand that's been around since 1871, was a flavor explosion. It was founded by pharmacist H.M. Culver in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Back then, they weren't just about plain seltzer or primary cola. White Rock offers a mind-bending journey with unique and exotic flavors for your taste buds. Imagine sipping on a frosty, prickly pear soda, savoring the tartness of the desert fruit. Or perhaps a black cherry soda wasn't your thing, and you crave the tropical twist of a mango or even a berry berry, a mix of blueberry and raspberry. White Rock had it all at a price comparable to other sodas. Bold flavors enchanted consumers, offering a flavorful journey from local shelves. Ads evoked exotic lands, enticing viewers with every sip. While White Rock's drinks were a delightful departure from convention, not all flavors endured. Many vanished by the late 20th century, perhaps due to changing taste and evolving trends. Today's selection focuses on classic flavors and modern trends, leaving passion fruit and guava sodas of the 1960s as cherished memories. After the exotic flavors of White Rock beverages fade into memory, what led to Fizzy's initial success and how have they fared in the ever-evolving beverage market since their heyday in the 1960s? Drop a Fizzy's in a glass, watch the magic come to pass. Fizzy's bubble and fizz, they're so exciting. Isn't that something? Now Lucky opens without an opener. Number 11, Lucky Lager. Lucky Lager, a California classic, was brewed by the Lucky Lager Brewing Company founded in San Francisco in 1933. This light, easy-drinking lager quickly gained popularity on the West Coast, especially during the post-war economic boom. Their iconic advertising campaign featuring the cartoon character Lucky the Leprechaun helped solidify brand recognition. However, Lucky Lager's fortunes changed hands in the 1980s when it was acquired by the Miller Brewing Company. Miller's focus shifted away from Lucky Lager and production eventually ceased in the early 2000s. Despite this, Lucky Lager is still fondly remembered by many West Coast beer drinkers, and there have been rumors of a possible comeback in recent years. In fact, in 2019, the Paps Brewing Company announced that Lucky Lager brand would be revived with a new recipe brewed by the 21st Amendment Brewery in San Leandro, California. This attempted revival shows the enduring legacy of Lucky Lager and the desire for its return among some consumers. When you thirst for something wet, cold, and delicious, open a can or bottle of National Bohemian Beer. So light, so refreshing. Number 12, National Bohemian or Natty Bow. National Bohemian or Natty Bow for short, was a Baltimore staple the National Brewing Company brewed. Established in 1885, National Bohemian was a true Marylander, a classic American lager known for its smooth taste and reasonable price. By the 1970s, Natty Bow was undeniably a regional powerhouse, with nearly 90% of its sales concentrated in Baltimore. Natty Bow wasn't shy about its Baltimore pride. Their iconic one-eyed mustachioed mascot, Mr. Bow, embodied the city's blue-collar spirit. National Bohemian, oh boy, what a beer! The brewery sponsored local sports teams at events, further strengthening its connection with the community. However, by the 1970s, the National Brewing Company faced increased competition from national brands. The company was sold in 1975 and production shifted away from Baltimore. While Natty Bow is still brewed today under contract by Paps Brewing Company, it no longer has the same local character. With the last sips of Natty Bow evoking memories of Baltimore's blue collar charm, Europe. Number 17, Ginny. As its slogan proclaimed, Ginny, the hottest cold drink, was a French import that took the 1960s by storm. Created by Perrier in 1971, though launched in the US in the 1960s, it wasn't your mediocre lemon-lime soda. Ginny offered a unique twist, a perfectly balanced blend of sweet and tart with a touch of quinine for a subtle bitterness. Priced competitively with other sodas, it was a refreshing choice for those seeking something different. The public loved Ginny's bold flavor profile, 
Unlike its American counterparts, Jenny was fearless in being more complex. Commercials featuring energetic characters and bold visuals solidified its place in pop culture. However, Jenny's reign in the U.S. market proved short-lived. By the late 20th century, it became increasingly difficult to find. The exact reasons for this are unclear, but increased competition and a shift in consumer preferences towards sweeter sodas might have been factors. Did Grain Belt Beer's journey through Minnesota's brewing history parallel Natty Bo's regional rise and subsequent evolution? Then you pour a bone-chilling glass of Grain Belt Beer. Number 13, Grain Belt Beer. Grain Belt Beer, a Minnesota legend, was originally brewed by the Minneapolis Brewing Company, formed in 1890 through the merger of four smaller breweries. Their signature brew, Grain Belt Golden Lager, was a hit right from the start in 1893. This easy-drinking golden lager, a nod to the state's agricultural heritage, quickly became the company's flagship product. Despite its early success, the Minneapolis Brewing Company wasn't immune to industry hardships. Prohibition temporarily forced them to halt production in the 1920s, and competition intensified in the following decades. While Grain Belt remained popular regionally, especially in Minnesota, the brewery closed its doors in 1975. Nevertheless, the story of Grain Belt doesn't end there. In 2002, the August Shell Brewing Company, another Minnesota brewer with a long history, purchased the Grain Belt brand. They revived production and expanded the offerings beyond the classic golden lager. Today, Grain Belt enjoys a renewed popularity, particularly within Minnesota, and serves as a reminder of the deep brewing roots of the North Star State. You can taste the difference. What a difference. In the cleaner, fresher, true beer flavor on Crystal Global Beer. Number 14, Global Beer. Once a Detroit king, Goebel beer was brewed by the Goebel Brewing Company, founded in 1873 by German immigrant August Goebel Sr. Goebel quickly became a leader in Detroit's booming brewing scene. Their brew was a dry, light lager, perfect for the working class city. Their slogan, from the Cypress cask of Goebel, highlighted their commitment to quality. Goebel's popularity peaked in the 1950s, sponsoring local sports teams and becoming a beloved part of Detroit culture. However, the 1960s brought a turning point. A switch in brewers and a shift in consumer taste towards lighter beers hurt sales. Goebel struggled to compete with national brands. In 1964, their Detroit rival, Stroh's, acquired the Goebel Brewing Company. Although Goebel remained available, production eventually ceased entirely in 2005. As the memories of Goebel Beer's heyday in Detroit linger, did Drury's Beer, with its Midwestern charm and Canadian roots, face a fate similar to Goebel's rise and fall? Every single drop of Drury's Beer is brewed and mellowed an exclusive controlled way. Number 15, Drury's Beer. Drury's Beer, a Midwestern favorite with Canadian roots, was brewed by Drury's Brewing Company. Originally established in 1877 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, as the Lake of the Woods Brewery by E. L. Drury, it crossed the border in style. Drury's extra dry lager became a major player, especially throughout the Midwest, by the 1930s after Prohibition had ended. They capitalized on their Canadian heritage with a red-coated Mountie mascot on their label, a symbol that stuck around for decades. Drury's success stemmed from its focus on a clean, crisp lager and affordability. It became a go-to choice for many working-class beer drinkers. Drury's beer, a perfect balance between flavor and lightness. Drury's beer, more flavor. However, by the 1970s, the American beer industry became more competitive. Lighter lagers and flashier brands took center stage. Drury struggled to keep pace, and ownership changed hands several times. The final blow came in the 1970s during the Beer Wars, a period of intense competition and consolidation within the brewing industry. Drury's production in South Bend, Indiana ceased in 1972, and the brand eventually faded away in the early 2000s. In recent years, there have even been whispers of a possible revival, keeping the dream alive for a return to this Canadian-born American locker. 
Number 7. Country Club Malt Liquor Country Club Malt Liquor, brewed by the M.K. Getz Brewing Company in the early 1950s, pioneered the malt liquor market. Unlike its competitors, who targeted a rough and tumble image, Country Club aimed for sophistication. Imagine neatly dressed folks enjoying it in fancy magazines, a stark contrast to the reality of malt liquor consumption. Priced competitively, Country Club was a strong contender. Packaged in smaller 8-ounce cans, it offered a more controlled way to experience the higher alcohol content than beers. The public reaction was mixed. Some enjoyed the extra kick, while others found it harsh. Despite its initial success, Country Club's popularity waned over time. The disconnect between its upscale marketing and the reality of the malt liquor consumption might have played a role. By the late 20th century, Country Club malt liquor became a niche product, while the Paps Brewing Company which acquired M.K. Getz, still produces it today, it's a shadow of its former self. Fall City's a light-bodied beer that's brewed for full flavor. Compare the taste, compare the price, you'll pick a city. Number 16, Fall City Beer. Fall City Beer, a Kentucky staple with a short but splashy run, was brewed by the Fall City Brewing Company established in Louisville in 1864. Fall City was a major player in the regional market by the 1970s, especially popular for its easy-drinking American lager. Their iconic Little Colonel mascot, a dapper gentleman with a cane, became a familiar sight in Kentucky. Well, my bartender is E.P. Sutton, and he recommends... Fall City. Fall City wasn't afraid to be playful. In the late 1970s, they rode a wave of unexpected fame with the launch of Billy Beer, a brand endorsed by Billy Carter, brother of then-president Jimmy Carter. While Billy Beer itself wasn't a major hit, it put Fall City in the national spotlight for a brief period. However, Fall City's success ultimately couldn't overcome industry trends. The focus on lighter beers and consolidation among larger breweries took its toll. By the late 1970s, Falls City Brewing Company faced financial difficulties and eventually shut down entirely in 1978. Blitz Weinhardt, from the oldest brewery in the West. Number 17, Blitz Weinhardt Beer. Blitz Weinhardt, a Pacific Northwest icon with a twist, was brewed by the Blitz Weinhardt Brewing Company. Founded in 1852 in Portland, Oregon by German immigrant Leopold Blitz, the company merged with Harry Weinhardt's brewery in 1878. Their signature brew was the Blitz Weinhardt Premium Lager, a light and crisp beer perfect for the region's climate. Blitz Weinhardt was undeniably a major player in the Pacific Northwest by the 1970s. Their commercials featuring the catchy jingle, I want to be a Blitz man solidified brand recognition and tied it to a sense of rugged individualism. What truly set Blitz Weinhardt apart was their use of Oregon hops, giving their beer a unique flavor profile that resonated with local drinkers. The 1980s shifted the industry, with national brands pushing for wider distribution. Blitz Weinhardt, focused on the Pacific Northwest, struggled to compete. The company was eventually acquired by the Stroh Brewery Company in 1989, and production of Blitz Weinhardt beer ceased altogether in the early 2000s. There have even been rumors of a comeback in recent years, with craft brewers taking inspiration from Blitz Weinhardt's focus on Oregon hops. Dear? Yes. Oregon, sir, is the home of Blitz Weinhardt. The echoes of Blitz Weinhardt's rugged Pacific Northwest spirit linger, but did half and refer private stock, with its enigmatic allure and smooth taste, face a fate similar to Blitz Weinhardt's regional prominence and subsequent disappearance? Beer, beer, beer. No, it's time for a change. You want a change of pace? Yeah, something really special. Number 18, half and refer private stock. Heffenreffer Private Stock, a malt liquor with a mysterious allure, was brewed by the Heffenreffer Brewery in Jamaica Plain, Boston. Founded in 1820, Heffenreffer was a well-established brewery, but Private Stock, launched in 1953, took a different route. Unlike most malt liquors, Private Stock wasn't shy about its ingredients. Their marketing often highlighted its private formula and long-age brewing process, creating an air of intrigue. 
Nicknames like the Green Death and Head Wrecker added to the beer's mystique, suggesting a potent brew. However, Hafenreffer Private Stock wasn't all about strength. It offered a smoother taste than some competitors, making it a more approachable option for malt liquor drinkers. Despite its popularity, the brand changed hands several times throughout the 1980s and 90s. With a shift in consumer preferences toward lighter beers, Hafenreffer Private Stock eventually faded from production in the early 2000s. Even though it's gone, Half and Refer Private Stock holds a special place in the memories of some beer drinkers, particularly those who enjoyed its unique taste and the lure surrounding it. In recent years, there might have even been rumors of a possible return, suggesting that the Green Death might not be gone for good. Crisp and clean cut to the taste. Number 19, Ham's Beer. Ham's Beer, cherished in the Midwest for its extensive heritage, was crafted by the Theodore Ham's Brewing Company, founded in 1865 in St. Paul, Minnesota. Renowned for its American pale lager style, Ham's boasted a smooth taste and a harmonious blend of malt and hops. During the 1970s, Ham's Beer surged in popularity, standing tall among America's beloved brews. It held a prominent position as one of the nation's top-selling beers, annually distributing millions of barrels. Its iconic marketing campaigns starred the animated Ham's Bear, an innovative mascot in the beer realm, delighting in nature and serenading audiences with the memorable Land of Sky Blue Waters jingle. Refreshing. Refreshingly yours from the Land of Sky Blue Waters. Nevertheless, by the late 1990s, Ham's Brewing Company had undergone an acquisition by the brewing conglomerate InBev. With InBev's focus veering away from Ham's beer, it eventually ceased production in the early 2000s. Number one, Schaefer Beer. Schaefer Beer was a major player in the American brewing scene, brewed by the F&M Schaefer Brewing Company in Brooklyn, New York. Founded in 1842, it became a national success story by the 1960s, reaching its peak in 1962 with a whopping 12 million barrels sold. Schaefer was known for its crisp, clean taste and its eye-catching red, white, and blue can. However, the 1970s and 80s brought new challenges as consumer taste shifted. Schaefer struggled to keep up with the changing market and eventually fell behind. The Stroh Brewery Company acquired them in 1981 and later, in 1999, Pabst Brewing Company took over Stroh's, including the Schaefer brand. Today, Schaefer still exists. How did these once mighty breweries succumb to the changing tides of consumer preference? Number two, Blatt's Beer. Blatt's Beer, a Midwestern favorite, was brewed by the Blatt's Brewing Company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Founded in 1847, Blatt's became a major force by the 1960s, peaking in 1966 with a respectable 8.5 million barrels sold. Known for its easy drinking taste and its association with Milwaukee's brewing heritage, Blatt's was a popular choice for many. However, the company's journey went downhill after the 1960s. A series of mergers and acquisitions in the 70s and 80s took a toll on Blatt's. Pabst Brewing Company, which acquired Blatt's in the 1950s, eventually phased out the brand altogether by the early 1990s. While there have been rumors of revivals, Blatt's remains largely a forgotten name in the American beer scene. It's Blatt's Brew, Blatt's Beer, wherever you go. Number three, Burgermeister Beer. Burgermeister Beer was a budget-friendly brew that rose to fame in the 1960s. Owned by the Burgermeister Brewing Corporation, which Pabst Brewing Company later acquired, Burgermeister hit its peak in 1967 with a staggering 18 million barrels sold. That's a massive achievement, making it one of the most popular beers of the era. Known for its affordability and its catchy slogan, Burgermeister Beer, it's Burgermeister time, the beer became a go-to for many. However, Burgermeister's reign at the top wasn't meant to last. As the 1970s and 80s rolled on, consumer preferences shifted toward pricier, more premium beers. Budget brews like Burgermeister started to struggle. By the late 1980s, Burgermeister couldn't keep up with the changing market and faded from shelves, becoming a relic of the past. You'll find out how comfortable beer can be. Bertie, the comfort. 
With the memories of Burgermeister beer's heyday fading into nostalgia, the fate of Drury's beer emerges from the annals of brewing history. Number 4. Drury's Beer Drury's beer enjoyed a loyal following in the Midwest during the 1960s. Originally brewed by the Geo Rule Brewing Company in Wheeling, West Virginia, Drury's reached its peak in 1968 with a solid 7.5 million barrels sold. They were known for their smooth, easy drinking taste and their iconic green glass bottle. Drury's even had its mascot, a little green keg man named Mr. Drury, who was a memorable character in their advertisements. However, the 1970s brought on hard times for Drury's. The company faced increasing competition from national brands and struggled to keep up. In 1963, they sold out to the Associated Brewing Company, and later the brand bounced around between different owners. While the Drury's name stuck around for a while, it eventually disappeared from store shelves altogether by the late 1980s. Interestingly, there was a revival attempt in 2011 by a Chicago entrepreneur, but it never quite captured the magic of the original Drury's. Number 5. Drury's Old Stock Ale Drury's Old Stock Ale wasn't from a separate company. Number 6. Falstaff Beer Falstaff Beer was brewed by the Falstaff Brewing Corporation in St. Louis, Missouri. Their roots go back to the historic Lemp Brewery, founded in 1840, but they adopted the Falstaff name in 1903, inspired by the Jolly Knight from Shakespeare. Falstaff enjoyed booming business in the 1960s, rivaling brands like Schlitz and Miller. They peaked in 1965 with an astonishing over 7 million barrels sold. They were known for their easy drinking lagers and their memorable slogan, Falstaff, the refreshing taste. However, the 1970s brought a downturn for Falstaff. Increased competition and a shift in consumer preferences toward lighter beers hurt their sales. The company went through a series of mergers and acquisitions, ultimately losing its independent identity. By the late 1980s, Falstaff beer had faded from most store shelves. While the Pamps Brewing Company now owns the rights to the brand, Falstaff itself remains largely a forgotten name in the American beer scene. And you're ready to enjoy it. Satisfying to your man-sized Number 7. Falls City Beer Falls City Beer, a Louisville legend, was brewed by the Falls City Brewing Company. Born in 1905, it wasn't your typically family-owned brewery. Instead, it rose from a group of local tavern and grocery store owners who wanted to fight back against the local monopoly. With a name that paid homage to Louisville's nickname, Falls City, they set out to become a major regional player. Falls City enjoyed a prosperous run in the 1960s, competing with national brands. Their claim to fame was their light-bodied pale lager, perfect for easy drinking. As distribution opened up in seven states, it soon hit a peak of 750,000 barrels of beer per year. The slogan, Falls City, Louisville's Finest, captured the hearts and taste buds of many locals. The 1970s, however, proved challenging. They faced increased competition from national brands and a shift in consumer preferences toward lighter beers. Falls City, known for its pale lagers, struggled to adapt. In 1975, the Falls City Brewing Company was acquired by the Heilemann Brewing Company, and over the next few decades, the Falls City brand slowly faded from shelves. Despite a revival attempt in 2010, Falls City today remains a regional player, a shadow of its former glory in the 1960s. Number 8. Goble Beer Goble Beer was a Detroit favorite brewed by the Goble Brewing Company. Founded in 1873 by German immigrant August Goebel Sr. and Theodore Gorenflo, Goebel quickly established itself as a major player in the Midwest. By the 1960s, it was a household name in Detroit. Goebel sold only 300,000 barrels in 1960. However, it was known for its quality lagers and cream ales with a catchy slogan, Goebel, the Goebel beer. They were a staple at social gatherings and sporting events, building a loyal following. However, the 1970s brought a shift in taste. Consumers began seeking lighter beers, and national brands gained popularity. Goebel, focused on traditional styles, struggled to adapt. The Stroh Brewery Company acquired Goebel in 1979, and Goebel's presence slowly began to shrink. By the early 2000s, 
Goble beer had faded from most store shelves. Today, the Pabst Brewing Company, which owns the Stroh brands, still holds the rights to Goble. However, Goble beer remains largely a forgotten name. Cleaner, fresher, true beer flavor on Christmas. After the memories of Goble Beer's heyday in Detroit fade into obscurity, thoughts turn to another beloved, which was Ham's Beer. How does the rise and fall of Ham's parallel the fate of Goble? Number 9. Ham's Beer Ham's Beer, a popular American lager, was brewed by the Theodore Ham Brewing Company in St. Paul, Minnesota. Founded in 1865 by German immigrant Theodore Ham, the company grew from a small local brewery into a national success story. By the 1960s, Ham's reached its peak, becoming a favorite at barbecues and social gatherings around the country. At its height in 1968, Ham's boasted a whopping 7.8 million barrels sold, a testament to its immense popularity. Their smooth taste and iconic red can have made them instantly recognizable. However, the good times wouldn't last forever. The 1970s saw a major shift in consumer preferences toward lighter beers. Hams, known for their traditional lagers, struggled to adapt to this changing market. The company went through a series of acquisitions throughout the following decades, slowly losing its independence. By the early 2000s, Hams beer had faded from most store shelves. Hams, tap and regular, is brewed natural, nothing artificial. The more beer you're going to have, the more... Number 10. Hudipole Beer Hudipole Beer, a Cincinnati favorite, was brewed by the Hudipole Brewing Company. Founded in 1885 by Louis Hudipole II, the company became a major force in the Ohio Valley by the 1960s. Hudipole was known for its delicious lagers and cream ales, perfect for quenching thirst at social gatherings and sporting events. Their catchy slogan, Hudipole, the friendly beer, captured the hearts of many Cincinnati residents. However, the 1970s brought a wave of change. Consumer preferences shifted towards lighter beers and national brands. Hudipole, focused on traditional styles, found it difficult to compete. Unlike some of its contemporaries that larger companies gobbled up, Hudipole soldiered on for a while, but the tide had turned. In 1986, Hudipole finally merged with their competitor, the Schoenling Brewing Company. Even this couldn't save them entirely. The Hudipole brand slowly faded away over the next few decades. Isn't that something? Now Lucky opens without an opener. Number 11. Lucky Locker Lucky Locker, a Californian icon, was brewed by the General Brewing Company in San Francisco. Established in 1933, just after Prohibition ended, Lucky Locker rode the wave of renewed interest in beer. It quickly gained a loyal following, becoming the second best-selling beer in California by 1937. Lucky Locker undoubtedly remained a West Coast favorite throughout the decade. They were known for their crisp, clean taste and their classic red, white, and blue can standing out on store shelves. However, Lucky Lager's luck wouldn't last forever. The 1970s and 80s saw a rise in the popularity of national brands and new brewing styles. Lucky Lager, focused on traditional lagers, struggled to keep pace. The company went through a series of acquisitions, eventually landing with the Pabst Brewing Company in 1999. While Pap still owns the Lucky Lager brand today, it's no longer widely available. As Lucky Lager's California legacy faded amidst changing beer trends, Narragansett beer stood tall as a symbol of New England pride. How did the crisp taste of Lucky Lager compare to the smooth lagers of Narragansett, each a reflection of regional brewing traditions? Number 12. Narragansett Beer Narragansett Beer, a Rhode Island legend, was brewed by the Narragansett Brewing Company in Cranston, Rhode Island. Founded in 1890, Narragansett rose to become the number one selling brand in all of New England by the 1960s. Their iconic slogan, Hi neighbor, have a consent, became a familiar refrain throughout the region. Narragansett was known for its smooth, easy drinking lagers and its deep connection to New England culture. However, the 1970s brought a shift in the brewing landscape. National brands and new beer styles gained popularity, and Narragansett, focused on traditional styles, struggled to compete. The company changed hands several times, and production eventually ceased in 1981. For many New Englanders, Narragansett wasn't just a beer, it was a symbol of home. Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. 
In 2012, a group of investors revived the Narragansett brand, and today it's once again brewed under the historic name. While it may not hold the top spot in New England anymore, Narragansett's return shows the enduring love many have for this classic beer. Number 14, Olympia Beer. Olympia Beer, a Pacific Northwest icon, was brewed by the Olympia Brewing Company in Turnwater, Washington. Founded in 1896 by German immigrant Leopold Schmidt, Olympia quickly gained a loyal following for its crisp, clean lagers. Their famous slogan, It's the Water, highlighted the pure water source used for brewing, which they claimed was the key to their beer's exceptional taste. By the 1960s, Olympia became a regional powerhouse, reaching its peak in 1976 with a respectable 3.1 million barrels sold. However, Olympia's journey hit a roadblock in the late 1970s. The rise of national brands and changing consumer preferences took a toll. Olympia focused on traditional lockers and struggled to compete with the lighter beers that were gaining popularity. The company went through several acquisitions throughout the 1980s and 90s, eventually losing its local identity. Production at the historic Turnwater Brewery ceased in 2003. Now, Pabst Brewing Company still owns Olympia beer, but it's brewed at a different location and no longer holds the same regional dominance. But you'd taste the difference if we didn't, so we do. Olympia, it's the water and a lot more. How does this rise and fall of regional dominance contrast with the enduring popularity and cultural resonance of PBR? Number 15, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Pabst Blue Ribbon, or PBR, is a bit of an anomaly on this list. While it's included due to its surge in popularity during the 1960s, it's important to note that the brand never truly went away. Originally called Best Select, then Pap Select, the Paps Brewing Company, established in 1844 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, adorned its bottles with blue ribbons between 1882 and 1916. The exact reason for the name change to Paps Blue Ribbon is a little fuzzy. The company claims it won America's Best at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago but some accounts suggest no such prize was awarded. Regardless, by the 1960s, PBR was a well-established brand known for its affordability and crisp taste. However, PBR's journey took an interesting turn. Unlike many other beers on the list, PBR never truly disappeared. Instead, it became associated with counterculture movements and budget-minded consumers in the 1970s and 1980s. Today, it's seen as a hipster favorite and a symbol of a more carefree time. So unlike the others yearning for a comeback, Pabst Blue Ribbon remains a relevant player in the beer scene, albeit in a different way than in its 1960s heyday. Number 16, Peel's Beer. Peel's Beer, a New York favorite brewed by the Peel's Brother Brewery, was a major force in the Northeast during the 1960s. Founded in Brooklyn in 1881 by the Peel Brothers, the company became known for its light, easy-drinking lagers. Their most famous slogan, Peel's Pilsner, it's Peel Good, captured the essence of their brand. Peel's was a dominant player in the New York market and enjoyed strong sales throughout the Northeast. They were popular for backyard barbecues and corner pubs, building a loyal following with their consistent quality and refreshing taste. However, the 1970s brought a wave of change. Consumer preferences shifted towards lighter beers and national brands. Peel's, focused on traditional lagers, struggled to adapt. The company was acquired by the Schaefer Brewing Company in 1972 and then later absorbed by the Pabst Brewing Company in 1989. Throughout these acquisitions, Peel's slowly faded away from store shelves. By the early 2000s, Peel's beer had all but disappeared. And it does. Now let's make a few mouths water. All right. Uh, hey, I asked for a better shot of the label on the 12 ounce bottle. Peel's tastes best of all. Number 17, Red Top Beer. In the 60s, the Red Top Brewing Company in Cincinnati, Ohio, brewed one of America's forgotten gems, Red Top Beer. It was a beloved brew known for its crisp taste and smooth finish. Red Top Beer gained popularity in the Midwest particularly in Ohio, where it was a staple at local bars and gatherings. During its peak in the mid-1960s, Red Top Beer boasted impressive sales figures, with over a half a million barrels sold annually. However, despite its success, 
Red Top Beer faced stiff competition from larger breweries and changing consumer preferences. As tastes shifted toward lighter lagers and mass-produced beers, Red Top struggled to maintain its market share. Unfortunately, this led to its discontinuation in the late 1960s. Tap has extra flavor, the heart only a fine ale can give you. Try it yourself. After the memories of Red Top Beer's crisp taste linger, thoughts drift to the iconic Rheingold Beer of New York. Could the nostalgic yearning for Red Top's return rival the hopes for Rheingold's resurgence? Number 18, Rheingold Beer. Rheingold Beer, once a New York icon, was brewed by the Liebman Brewery in Brooklyn. Founded in 1860 by the Liebman family, the brewery thrived for over a century. By the 1950s and 60s, Rheingold became a national success story thanks to its catchy advertising campaigns and crisp pilsner. Their peak came in 1962 with a whopping 12 million barrels sold, making them a major player in the American brewing scene. Rheingold was known for its smooth taste, its eye-catching red, white, and blue can, and its famous slogan, Rheingold, the dry beer. However, the 1970s brought a shift in the market. Rising labor costs and fierce competition from national brands squeezed Rheingold's profits. In 1964, the Liebman family sold the company to Pepsi-Cola bottlers. While they attempted to revive the brand with new marketing strategies, it wasn't enough. Consumer taste shifted towards lighter beers, and Rheingold, focused on traditional styles, struggled to keep pace. Production at the Liebman Brewery ceased in 1976, and the Rheingold brand slowly faded from shelves. There have been attempts at a comeback in recent years, with the brand being acquired by new ownership. However, Rheingold has yet to recapture its former glory. Man, it's happily dry, happily dry, friendly and fresh. Number 19, Ballantine Ale. Ballantine Ale hailed from the P. Ballantine & Sons Brewing Company in Newark, New Jersey. Established in 1850, the company gained a loyal following throughout the Northeast for its quality sales. They enjoyed success alongside the company's other offerings, like Ballantine IPA, known for its unique oak age flavor. Ballantine even sponsored professional sports teams and had a memorable presence in advertising. The 1970s, however, marked a turning point. The rise of national brands and a shift in consumer preferences towards lighter beers began to squeeze Ballantine Ale. The P. Ballantine & Sons Brewing Company faced financial difficulties, and by the 1980s, Ballantine Ale production had eventually ceased. Despite its disappearance, Ballantine Ale remains a noteworthy reminder of a time when craft beers and regional favorites thrived. In recent years, there's even been a renewed interest in these forgotten styles, and some craft brewers have attempted to create beers reminiscent of Ballantine Ale. Ballantine, Ballantine. Number 20, F&M Schaefer Brewing Company. The F&M Schaefer Brewing Company, once a New York giant, brewed Schaefer beer, a popular American-style lager. Founded in Manhattan in 1842 by the Schaefer brothers, the company became one of the most successful breweries in the United States by the early 1900s. They were known for their consistent quality, easy-drinking lagers, and iconic slogan, Schaefer, the beer of moderation. Increasing competition from national brands and changing consumer preferences took a toll. Schaefer focused on traditional lagers and struggled to adapt to a market seeking lighter beers. In 1968, the company went public in an attempt to boost resources, but it wasn't enough. Schaefer was eventually acquired by the Stroh Brewery Company in 1981. Production at the Brooklyn Brewery ceased in 1986, marking the end of an era for this historic brand. Nowadays, Schaefer beer is still brewed under the Pabst Brewing Company umbrella, which acquired Stroh in 1999, but it's no longer a major player in the American beer scene. Is the one beer to have when you're having more than one? <gasps> Billy Beer! Ooh, 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 ooh. Billy Beer. Billy Beer was launched in 1977, a product of the spotlight on Billy Carter, the colorful and often controversial brother of then-president Jimmy Carter. The beer was meant to capitalize on Billy's public persona, appealing to people who enjoyed his down-to-earth and humorous style. It was brewed by multiple breweries across the United States, aiming for a light, drinkable beer that would be popular among the working class. 
When it hit store shelves, a six-pack of Billy Beer generally cost around $2, which was competitive with other beers. Individual cans might have been priced between 30 to 40 cents. At launch, Billy Beer attracted attention due to its namesake's association with the White House, creating a curiosity factor. It was sold nationwide and was priced competitively, typically slightly lower than other mainstream beers. However, the novelty quickly wore off and sales declined as Billy's public image became more controversial. By 1978, the hype had faded and Billy Beer was discontinued.